Good evening. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Larkspur City Council. Uh, we're trying something new this evening. We're having a hybrid uh, session where some members of, of the council and some members of the public will be attending virtually. And we have other members in the council chambers this evening. So I'm sure we'll be able to work things out. Uh, I think we'll begin this evening's evening uh, meeting with a roll call. Allison, would you please call the roll? Council Member Candell. Uh, I am here remotely. Thank you. Council Member Hara. Here. Council Member Way. Here. Vice Mayor Paulson. Here. Mayor Homer. Uh, here. Um, as is our custom, we're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. So those in the council chambers, if you're able, please rise and join us in the pledge. Those virtually, please do so. And this evening, please, uh, I'm going to be making the pledge and thinking about uh, our, how fortunate we are to be in a, uh, a republic and have a democracy and it's worth defending and we should think about those that are defending theirs. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. The first item on this evening's agenda is public comment. Are there members of the public in attendance this evening that would like to make comments or ask questions on items that are not on the agenda? Allison, are there members of the public in that would like to make public comment? Yes, I'm looking for any raised hands from our Zoom audience member participants, or if anyone in the council chambers wishes to go to the podium for public comment. And there is no public comment. Thank you very much. Uh, we have no presentations or proclamations this evening. So we'll move on to number four on the calendar on the agenda is approval of the consent calendar. Are there any members of the city council either in the chambers or remotely that would like to ask questions or remove items for discussion from the consent calendar? Seeing none, are there members of the public that would like to ask questions or make comments on items on this evening's consent calendar? I'm looking for any raised hands from our Zoom audience or anyone from our council chamber audience. There's no public comment. I'll return the consent calendar to the city council for consideration. Uh, I would entertain a motion. I'd be happy to move uh, approval of the consent calendar. A second. Council member Haroff makes the motion. Council member Paulson seconds. Allison, would you please call a roll, make a roll call vote? Council member Kandel? Yes. Council member Haroff? Yes. Council Member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Paulson? Yes. Mayor Homer? Yes. The consent calendar passes unanimously. We'll move on to item five on the agenda this evening. It's the city manager's oral report. Good evening, Dan. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. Thank you. I'll, uh, I have three items I wanted to highlight. Uh, I was struck driving to City Hall uh, earlier today, how smooth my ride was out on Magnolia, and I hope folks uh, are enjoying. Um, we uh, have our public works director, Julian Skinner, here, and we owe him a huge debt of gratitude. He's implemented a program that has fixed roads all throughout the city. This summer, we'll do the last phase. We're very excited about that, and then we'll switch to making sure our investment is maintained into the future. I bring that up because I, I want to acknowledge the trust of the voters that they gave us to give us the funds to make that happen. Uh, and to kind of announce something that will be going up on our uh, website very soon, which is the announcement of a speakers bureau. Um, it's going to be myself, Mr. Skinner and uh, Fire Chief Ruben Martin talking about the infrastructure challenges we still face in the city and some of the other capital needs and service needs we have in the city um, and talk to the voters about what our options might be if they would uh, 
consider in the future supporting us again. It's the beginning of a conversation. It's not a decision. We want to engage the public and hear from them and inform them about the challenges. And so we encourage everyone to look to uh, the city website and to next door and to our other uh, media platforms and we'll announce, we'll launch with a Zoom <coughs> meeting and then we'll be doing in-person meetings throughout the community. Uh, two other things I wanna highlight for you. Uh, one is that, um, oh, sorry, actually, see my assistant to the city manager is sending me, reminding me there actually is a date and I should announce it. So the first Zoom meeting has said it's actually April 19 at 6 p.m. So look for the exact details with the link, but that's the date and time. Um, two other things I wanted to highlight. One is if you haven't visited livinginlarkspur.com, please do so. The city of Larkspur, like the other communities in Marin, is knee deep in the process of updating our housing element, uh, more so than probably any other time when we've revisited this document. Um, we're talking about decisions that will uh, shape our community for the significant future. And that's because um, we're being asked to accommodate a significant number of housing units in going forward. And um, our team has put together an interactive website livinginlarkspur.com. There's also a link on the city's website to get you there, where you actually can find out sites around town that we're considering as potential sites to designate for future housing development. Um, and you actually can play with the numbers and suggest where you think housing is appropriate and how much housing is appropriate. And we value your feedback from the community. We want as much feedback as we can get. So please go there, sign up, participate. Uh, there will also be some upcoming meetings to talk more about our housing element ch challenges. And then lastly, I uh, wanted to let the community know that uh, Ride and Drive Marin will be holding a number of virtual and in-person events uh, this month to promote uh, EV vehicles, uh, which are, of course, all the more relevant as we go to the gas pump with our hopefully uh, not new normal prices for gas. Um, and uh, the city, we will have a link providing the dates and times of the various events around Marin so that our residents have an opportunity to participate. With that, Mr. Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dan. Are there members of the council that would like to ask questions or make comments regarding the city manager's report this evening? Kevin? I'm just glad those roads are paved. <laughs> That's all I can say. Yes, we'll have to schedule a, a calendar of, of uh, Julian Skinner and city staff days to celebrate, uh, give them credit that's due for all the work that's been done to date. I already told them that a boy, so I think that probably <laughs> covers it. <laughs> I'm sure that that, I'm sure it did. All right, we'll move uh, on to council members' oral reports and comments. Are there any council members that have reports this evening? Kevin? Uh, I do, uh, briefly. If the mic's on, I think it is. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, let folks know, I've mentioned this before about my plans to attend, but I've actually attended over the weekend of March 17th through the 20th. I attended the 30th annual Yosemite Policymakers Conference which brought over 100 California mayors, city council members, county supervisors, and other local government representatives to hear about and discuss issues of collective concern. Other local attendees included Marin County Supervisors Katie Rice and Stephanie Moulton Peters. Programming of the, con uh, the conference focused on transportation and work-related mobility issues. Our collective responses to COVID-19 and the path to new ways of conducting local government business as a result, housing, infrastructure, and environmental concerns. There was an additional focus on the growth of community choice aggregation and supporting the state's electrical energy needs. As a member of the board of directors and the chair of MCE Clean Energy's executive policy committee, that was an issue of particular interest to me personally. So, I just wanted to take this opportunity to express appreciation for the city's support in facilitating my attendance at the conference. 
it was a very worthwhile experience. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Council Member Way. Hi, thank you for um, this great ad adventure at hybrid meetings. Um, I really appreciate it as I continue to navigate health problems in my household. So um, I'm hoping to join you soon. It looks great where you are. Um, I have about four things to mention since last time we met. Um, the first was I attended uh, the Project Home Keys Advisory Committee meeting, um, which was nice to be held at the Central Marin Police Authority Community Building. Um, we met uh, and was well attended by all the existing uh, committee members, and hopefully we add two more residents tonight from Larkspur. Um, Chief Norton was not there, but uh, Lieutenant Kalili was, and it was nice to see that there was uh, a a depth of representation of our public safety officers. Um, there are three subcommittees of this. One is communications, one is public safety, and then program and metrics. And I was asked at that meeting to join the public safety uh, subcommittee. So um, stay tuned for that. We Our next meeting is uh, the last, I think it's April 23rd. It's coming up in a few weeks. The second was I attended virtually the um, Marin Mayors and Council Members Legislative Committee meeting on Monday. Uh, and it was a guest speaker of Senator Mike McGuire. And that was terrific to see him there. Um, he covered a lot of what's happening in Sacramento, which I won't go to, but he is now the, um, the leader of the Senate, which is great for um, Marin County to have that representation. One thing that he is going to try to lead in this year is getting PG&E's wires undergrounded. So we'll see how that goes, but he is adamant about that. Um, and I'll, I'll continue to follow that. Uh, the third was uh, Kevin and myself attended the Chamber of Commerce Mixer at uh, Ward, on Ward Street at the Farm Shop Local. And that was uh, just last Thursday. And that was a very complimentary to the downtown uh, corridor uh, renovation that we've done. Most of the mer people who attended were merchants in the downtown corridor, and they were um, very pleased with the collaboration that they got with the city and the uh, construction crew. So kudos to you, uh, Julian, if, if about that. Um, it's also just to let everyone know that even though it's not a Chamber of Commerce direct event, the Bonaire Shopping Center is going to be celebrating its 70th birthday with a big all day family affair um, on May 7th. And then lastly, um, everybody should have gotten, and I can't really do this remotely, but everybody should have gotten in the mail, or hopefully many people did, the Commons from the library, um, the Commons Foundation's brochure. And they are hosting an event called Touch Truck on uh, May 22nd. And that is going to be an, a fun family event with all of these construction vehicles, et cetera, um, at Redwood High School. It's really geared towards younger families uh, so that they can sit inside trucks and, and uh, fire trucks and all sorts of fun things as a fundraiser. Uh, I think that about covers my actions in the last two weeks for the city. Um, although I am remote, I just want everyone in the audience and all the constituents to know I'm still available by email and um, in-person meetings. Uh, as I work to get some um, home care coverage. Thanks. Thank you. Are there other council members that would like to make reports this evening? Vice Mayor Paulson. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just have a few uh, brief items um, from essentially from the fire, uh, fire safety side of things. So the NRGs are continuing to meet every month and we know that it's been a very dry summer and it's, you know, we're really kind of bracing ourselves for, for you know, what, what might happen with the wildfire season coming. Um, so we all know the Ross Valley Shaded Fuel Break project is going on. That's really encouraging. Um, another thing that, that we're really looking at is insurance. So um, there are models in other states like Colorado. Uh, there's a group called Wildfire Partners and there's certain programs that would ensure or help that people don't lose their fire insurance even in the WUI. So that's something that both the MWPA and, and some of the energies are looking at and I'll certainly bring any information as it comes. Um, the other thing is, is we have a lot of grassroots activism. People are very concerned in Madrone and in uh, Blue, Blue, you know, Oyster, um, Blue Rock and, and other places. And so 
uh, the the alignment of all the groups is something that that uh, you know the the staff is working on as well. So the CERT program and the NRG program and where the police come in for evacuations and so forth. That's something that we're discussing actively, so people have better drills and know what's what's going on. And just to echo the um, uh, city managers. Uh, you know, message of living in Larkspur. It's a, it's a great website. Um, one approach, you know, something that I encourage every resident to do is just to print out, you know, some of the, the site documents and then take a walking tour or a bike tour, however, and really, you know, try to get a feel because this is our town and, you know, our own visualization of where these different housing units will go is, is going to be critical. So um, hopefully we get more input on that. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other council member reports this evening? All right, we'll move on to we'll move on to our public hearings. Um, I'll open the public hearing. Uh, we have one item this evening. It's a text amendment, number twenty one dash twelve, ordinance one zero five four, to adopt amendments to the Rose Garden Precise Development Plan and the Central Larkspur Specific Plan, adopted by resolution forty eight slash zero six. This is an item continued from December 1st, 2021. May we please have a staff report. Is it on? Okay. I'm not very loud sometimes, so <laughs> make sure you can hear me. Good to see you all back. This is really interesting after all this time, feels different. Um, as you mentioned, this application was previously continued from the December 1st, 2021 meeting. And um, is there, I'm sorry, is there a visual? All of my screen set shows is presentation. I just want to make sure we're getting it for everybody. There's no visual. There's no visual. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> during your consideration of the application to amend the precise plan for the Rose Garden subdivision, um, you did hear from staff read all the materials and had oral testimony from the neighbors and most of the neighbors presenting information were largely concerned with potential drainage impacts from the amendment. Um, and the reason they thought there would be uh, impacts is that the existing backyards for lots 22 through 29 currently aren't allowed to have any impervious surfaces. Uh, since that time, um, staff has had time to sort of reassess the information we have look into whether or not we can obtain additional drainage studies, which turned out to be quite difficult to obtain. Um, and we then really evaluated the information we had and based on the studies from WRA, the existing drainage program that was in, approved and installed at the Rose Garden subdivision and the drainage calcs that were included in that, the city engineer in his, um, he um, evaluated all the information and determined that the, the um, drainage impacts would really be negligible as a result of this amendment because the backyards of these lots were already calced as if they would have hardscape. Hmm. So because of that, we didn't return to the Planning Commission as well to consider uh, potential options for restricting hardscaping and structures on the site because they were already calced and the drainage is already designed to accommodate the yards as if the entire thing could be paved with a very small percentage um, that wasn't included that would have just a negligible impact. Um, so we gave you a couple questions in the staff report and we asked you to determine first off if the memo presented to you by the city engineer is sufficient to address your drainage concerns. and um, or if you need anything additional in that respect, and whether or not we could then proceed forward with the public hearing on the ordinance amendment. Um, it, it seems that if there is no drainage concerns then potentially there should be no concerns with going back to the commission for limits on hardscaping and structures. So and that concludes my report. Sorry, I got totally off track when I got asked questions. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, do you have anything to add? I, I do not, Mr. Mayor. Are there council members that would like to ask questions uh, of staff on this item? Council, or council member Haroff? Yeah, just a quick question. So uh, procedurally, where we are is, what's the decision we need to make tonight? And is it, are we basically kicking it back to the planning commission? 
Well, we're asking if we can not kick it back to the Planning Commission, but move forward and come back for a full public hearing on the ordinance amendment itself before oh, the council. Okay. You know, the questions are, is the information we've provided you tonight adequate to address your prior concerns? Yeah. Yeah. And, and we felt the question you wanted to send back to the Planning Commission is sort of rendered moot that that was provided in the staff report. Are there other council members that would like to ask questions regarding this item uh, of staff? Are there members of the public that have questions on this item this evening? I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members or anyone from our in person audience. Give us just one moment. I see no one from the public, but that council member way has raised your hand. Council member way. Hi, so just so that I'm clear, because this was a long report, the concern that the residents brought to us and these parcels that abut the creek is that they are prohibited from adding hardscape or um, impervious uh, structures or materials to this, this strip of backyard that abuts the creek. And from what I read in these memos, this apparently, uh, the drainage issue was the concern originally in the Rose Lane um, development. But the recent uh, analysis is that these hardscape was already accounted for. And so there really isn't a problem with adding these structures or hardscape to the back um, by way of the drainage. If I, I'm correct with that, correct? Yes, essentially okay. the city engineer concluded that the calculations in the, in the drainage that's been installed in the stormwater runoff retention basins have all been designed to accommodate potential hardscape in the rear yards of these lots. Great. And then so the so if we move forward with it, then it becomes an administrative um, hearing. It just I'm just trying to be clear on it to make sure the residents know what the potential next steps are. Um, but along the way, we had uh, asked for a definition of an impermeable, but impermeable, but it doesn't seem like we really need that anymore. Am I right. correct? That's, that's what we're asking okay. to provide us direction on is, is if we can really just avoid that whole discussion with the commission and and permeable discussion as it seems to be rendered moot. Okay, great. Thank and, you. and the request is to give direction that it come back for the full public hearing for the text amendment. So there would not be an, a, any other action other than a council action at a public hearing. I hope that answers your question. Are there other council members that would like to, uh, or other members of the public that would like to ask questions? If not, I'll bring it back to the council for discussion and entertain uh, did you want any, description ask, for direction. Did you want to ask anybody in the public just wants to make a comment though? You, you framed it as a question to me. I'm very sorry. Just Are there sure. members of the public that would like to make comments or ask questions regarding this item? For any raised hands from our audience members on Zoom or in public. Hi. If you could please state your name and tell us where you live. Good evening. Good evening. Nice to be here in hybrid form <laughs> Zoom. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Chris Wheaton. I'm at 53 Rose Lane. Uh, I'm one of the Creekside homeowners that's impacted by the project. I serve on the HOA board for Rose Lane and have been one of a couple of people who's been the lead on this project. So I just wanted to let people know that we were available. Uh, residents are here in the audience available if you had questions that were specific to this. Initially, we brought this forward and I just want to clarify, we're really just looking at the 25 feet that are in our fenced yards. I did a presentation in December that outlined that that you could reference. It's not the full area from that we own, that the residents own from their from the back of their property in the creek. It's only that first twenty five feet we're trying to be able to be treated like other residents, I guess, uh, of Larkspur, in the sense that um, if you look at the staff report, there were studies that were done in twenty twelve that addressed drainage issues and other issues that could come up with respect to. Uh, backyards and if we were to put something that was impervious back there, uh, I believe the studies say that, that, that it would not impact the drainage of the water quality of the streams. So we're happy to see the staff report and I'm just here to 
advocate for moving the project forward. Thank you very much for your comments and your smile. <laughs> Are there other members of the public that would like to make comments on this item this evening? All right, I'll bring it back to the council for any further discussion and direction. Uh, Vice Mayor Paulson, would you like to start? Yeah, I was just ready to move this if uh, the council is ready to vote. Well, I think we're, they're looking for direction to come back for the public hearing, as opposed to asking for further information and therefore sending it back to the planning commission. Okay, so I guess we're, we're uh, what we need to, say is that the reports provided and the direction provided is adequate for the next step. And um, I'd like to bring that for a vote. At a, at a public hearing at a- at Yeah, a, at a public a hearing at a future coming meeting. meeting. Yeah. It'll probably be at your next meeting. That's next like, meeting. And if, I, if we get that direction. Uh, do I see nods here? I'll second that. Yeah. Dias? We don't, we don't, it's not a motion. It's just- yeah. for, for Just want to make sure that five of you are in agreement that now that we've had a chance to revisit the older studies and Mr. Skinner's found them adequate that you concur in that. And I'm getting the sense you all do. And if that's the case, I don't think it's necessary to send this item to the planning commission. So I'm seeing nodding heads to bring it back to you at the next council meeting. So nodded. Okay. Based, I'll look on the, based on the comprehensive. Scott and Catherine are nodding their heads. Agreed. Best, based <laughs> on the comprehensive Skinner memorandum. <laughs> well, I want to thank Mr. Skinner for taking time to go back into all those older analyses and see that they all had covered the questions that were raised at the last time that you heard this matter so all right i don't believe there are we i think you have direction thank you all right that concludes this item if there are, are no further comments thank you very much for all the work that went into it and the patience thank you All right, we'll close the public hearing and we'll move to the items on the business calendar. We have two under item eight. The first is item 8.1, which is to consider selecting two appointees to the community advisory group for 1251 South Alicio Drive. This is the project home key project. Uh, the council is going to uh, have reviewed the applications and we're going to consider selecting two appointees. Uh, is there a staff report, Dan? I think you just did the staff report, Mr. Mm -hmm. Mayor. <laughs> All right. Um, I would look to our uh, liaisons to the advisory group. Catherine, would you like to start the conversation? Sure. Uh, I have attended, like I said in my report, um, the advisory meeting, uh, which was also which was hybrid, also last uh, week. And it was well attended by uh, most of the members. There are a few who couldn't attend at that three, two o'clock hour on a Tuesday. So they're switching the time to be a little later in the day. Um, I think uh, what I was pleased with was that there's a, about six residents who already live on South Alicio from about the 600 block to the 1300 block. Um, and they were, um, I felt really able to to address the homeowners and uh, residents who live on that stretch of roads concerns. Um, they came forward with some and, and took that as a very important part of what their role is there. Um, there were also some members of the Kentfield community who are already on the advisory committee. Um, and I thought they were um, really asking some important questions about the, po the process that's going on. Um, I think some of our residents that have applied, it's it's such an awkward situation because we really can't do interviews like we typically do with library and community um, volunteers who sit on our boards and commissions. Um, in the previous round, there were those uh, personal interviews that could be done on Zoom. Um, I reached out to Councilmember Candell and we spoke to each other earlier in the evening. Um, and I think we are um, looking through the applicants are in agreement in um, support of at least one uh, between the two of us, um, but we'd like to open up to uh, the other members of the council to ask questions about whether um, these the individuals who applied um, may be uh, a fit for the group already. Does that make sense? 
I only actually know in this uh, list of, of, of residents who've applied only one resident that I know personally. So um, they do cross the spectrum from Murray Village, Murray uh, Park, Greenbrae to South Elysio, all the way down to Drake's Cove, I believe. Um, one of the uh, residents lives there. So um, we did attract a broader range. I was also looking at the current makeup of the advisory committee and there are eight women and nine men, if that matters. So we're pretty evenly split um, to that. So just sort of teeing it up that way. Um, That's great. Um, I would, uh, I myself would, would uh, greatly value recommendations coming from you and Scott, given that you're liaisons to the effort. Scott, I, do, you any, do you have any comments of an introductory nature here? Uh, yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to, to thank everybody who applied. Uh, everybody was outstanding, and you know, it's if if we don't choose you, it's not because you're not qualified. It's because we have so many people that are qualified. Uh, but the fact that we have so many people willing to step up to this type of role uh, just uh, says something fantastic about our community. And I just want to to thank everybody. And I, I'd like to echo that, that the, the work that I've learned about that's happened at Casa Buena and Corte Madera is that although they do have an advisory committee, they also have a lot of opportunities for volunteerism um, within, within the community for everything from um, <coughs> helping with meals and, and helping with activities to, uh, you know, outfitting the rooms or whatever. So there will be other opportunities I think it's key that at, the, at this process, we get leaders within particular, um, not only jurisdictions, but within interest groups. So for instance, we do have someone from the Kent Field School Board District there. We also have, um, they're looking for a safe routes to school um, uh, volunteer who could represent that. So I think it's very important that we get a broad constituency. Um, any of the other council members have a, a question or a thought? Um, I'm gonna to turn to Vice Mayor Paulson, but just comment that I'm very impressed at how the, uh, the organization and division of the work seems to be falling in, into place now, just from what I've heard. Uh, it's a very complex uh, set of issues and I, I really appreciate it that people are breaking it down into bite-sized pieces. That's, that's great, Vice Mayor Paulson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I guess uh, Catherine and Scott both. I'm really looking, you know, for guidance from you on selection criteria. So, as much as I was, you know, observing the process and, you know, talking to, I think I, you know, personally emailed 75 people who who emailed us, you know, concerned people about the project. Um, it seemed like public safety was a really big concern and. And you know, Councilmember Way, I'm just I'm really pleased that you're on that because I think not only are you level-headed, but you really understand public safety. So so I'm I'm assured. Um, but of the you know the people we have, the seven candidates, they they all look you know qualified. They they all look uh, you know like they'll bring something to the table. But again, back to selection criteria, um, it would seem to me that you know the voice of divergent opinion, like we you know really felt that um, many, many community members up to 2,500 who signed a petition really felt unheard. And to be quite honest, you know, six out of the seven members did not seem to reflect that voice very well. And, and I'm wondering if that should be a high criteria, what your thoughts are given how this you know, process has evolved. Um, and then, and then back to public safety, you know, personally, you know, talking to the police chief and you know, looking at different issues and, and trying to think through what the worst case scenario is. Um, my thought was, you know, I think everybody wants this to succeed if it's going to happen. We just don't want the worst thing to happen. So, you know, two things, which of these members would really uh, engage the group in constructive disagreements and divergent thinking and who would really have the most public safety minded thing to avoid you know, I, I think it's unlikely, but I keep comparing it to seatbelts. You know, I've never flown through a window, but I still wear a seatbelt. Who's going to really remind us of, you know, the worst case scenario and keep that on the table so that the DA and the sheriff and the public, you know, the police department are constantly being heard, not just the Episcopal Church and the rest of us who really want to see the homeless succeed. Well, it was my experience at the last meeting that, um, I mean, I think it's very important that we 
don't all um, have members of a committee who are all in lockstep agreement with each other about everything. And there has to be somebody, and I think Council Member Candela has brought this up from the very beginning, who really tries to um, ask the challenging questions and hold that the team from the county and Project Home Key accountable to the needs of the community. I felt at this last meeting where I was that there were already members there who um, are going to be very um, efficient with that. They asked a lot of challenging questions and I even appreciated the challenging questions the law enforcement um, representative was asking too. So I, I don't think that's gonna fall off the radar of any of us. Um, uh, of this, of the members that, that of in this advisory group application, Christy Chandler um, as an attorney and a criminal defense attorney and a, a, a mother and an educator was a choice that both Scott and I had discussed as someone whose application showed that she had a breadth of experience and knowledge in the subject matter. Um, so that's, and it was a, a comment in her um, application where she spoke to the need to develop trust and that trust is an important part of getting buy-in by the community and, and success. I think trust is something that um, a lot of people have expressed skepticism about in our previous time together. So um, I appreciated that she recognized that. Um, I, I, I have also worked on committees with Barry Fegan and he has um, been very instrumental in about in educating uh, boards and commissions about process and particularly conflict process. So my his application was also one of the only ones that actually listed numerically a one through six order of what he thought was uh, an important um, aspect of what this commission, this advisory committee should be engaged with. And it is also so much about public outreach. So those were kind of the only two that really stood out for me. Um, I know Mr. Cohen is, has uh, applied before in the previous, and he has um, sp spoken up at several of the online meetings. And I know he um, would probably continue to be a participant um, in the process, even if he wasn't appointed to the commission or to this. So that that's kind of where I land on it. It's it's, um, I'm trying to think of the balance. We're just getting to know each other in this um, advisory committee. Um, half the group was in San Francisco or out of the area when they zoomed in. So it's, it's just beginning to start to, to kind of come together as what people's strengths and um, interest area is. Um, but I, I do know the existing ones that are, are very outspoken. Nobody sits back and uh, just waits to listen. They're all very, um, they're not passive participants so far in the meetings I've gone to. I have a question for you and or Scott or uh, other council members. Are there, I'm, I'm going to say, in, use the word information areas in the conversation to represent um, information people might be able to bring to the conversation. People may be representative of a certain information area, whether it's on one side of the conversation or the other. Uh, given the list of people that have applied here, can you see these folks representing, quote, information areas that might be helpful that otherwise would not be represented in the advisory group? Well, that, you know, that's, it's hard to answer that in the extent that we've only met um, a couple of times now, and they're still trying to gel what the um, subcommittees are about. I think uh, measure someone who can understand matrix and measurable outcomes uh, and, and how we analyze um, successful outcomes and placement is really hasn't been well defined for me yet with this group. I think public safety is, is gonna be well understood by the breadth of knowledge of the already existing members and particularly how well and engaged our law enforcement community has been. Um, so to answer your question, I'm not really sure we have enough breadth of knowledge about this yet. You know, this this is going to be a year long process. And now you saw in the probably in the paper the other day that a, a group of uh, neighborhood group is suing the county um, about CEQA. So I don't even know where that's going to fall out. I, I guess I'll put my question a little more simply. 
um, there are people who come to this both for and against. Yeah. Do you think that the advisory group will represent a balance in that conversation? It's been my experience, yes. Having sat in okay. the two of these meetings now, I think that people um, feel that that's their obligation. That's why they, they uh, wanted to be on this originally. I don't, I think we have some people who are super supportive of it and, and um, but they are, uh, they've come across as balanced also. Well, I just wanna make sure that we do our best to provide all the information we can for a, a balanced uh, discussion. Oh, um, I agree. Uh, Council Member Hara. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I just want to cite, uh, circle back to Council Member Lay's um, suggestions for the two individuals um, that she named. I, I looked at the list of all the people and looked at the information that they had provided. I think they're all great and, and compelling in their own ways. Um, so I would be very deferential to your recommendation. And I think I heard that. So if we can proceed on that basis, I think that would be a good idea. Would uh, Council Member Kendall like to weigh in on, on that? Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, so, so, so Council, Council Member Way and I uh, spoke about this. I, I think we're in agreement uh, with the two choices that, that she had uh, voiced uh, based on the, uh, the applications that we had reviewed, you know, and, uh, you know, some other factors that we discussed. So uh, I, I, I would agree with her recommendations as well. All right. Uh, but, but I also want to make sure of those in the audience or who are or listening that we really, really need all of us in this process. Um, and there will be many opportunities to continue to engage in the public process um, by all these meetings that are going to be held and tours that are going to be held. And so this isn't stopping now. It's actually just starting. Uh, so just want to make sure people know that there are lots of ways that they can stay informed and we'll, we will make it our effort to do that. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Mayor Paulson. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo, I, I, yeah, after reading the applications, I felt Christy Chandler, independent of what you said, rose to the top for me. Um, and, and I appreciate all the other comments. Um, Council Member Candell, I'm just curious, you know, given that you, you really, uh, you know, took a kind of courageous stand and, and, you know, vocally opposed a lot of this. How are you feeling generally about the process? You know, I think, you know, Council Member Way was saying that there's a reasonable amount of balance and we have Kent Field School District representing and, and these choices are, are, and you're seeing the public safety officials and that's my number one concern. What are, what are your, you know, feelings about so far where we are? Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, frustration would be one of the adjectives that comes to mind. Um, I, I want this to succeed. Uh, in order for it to succeed, I think that concerns that the neighborhood has have to be taken seriously and have to be incorporated into the, uh, the plan moving forward. I think we are hopefully moving in that direction, um, but it's still early. So um, I, I would say, uh, I, I guess I, I have uh, uh, some, some, some guarded optimism. Uh, how is that? Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, do we need to have an action by the council, a formal uh, appointment of, for Christy Chandler and Barry Fegan? Um, or a motion? The mayor always has the right to appointment, or you can and have typically called for the support of your colleagues through call for a motion. So that's your discretion, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did, you may want to also ask if anyone from the public wanted to. Uh, yes, so. absolutely. Uh, so I will do that. And, I, and thank you for uh, reminding us of that important choice we make. I think it's important for us to do this as a group. Uh, Allison, would you see if there are members of the public that would like to make comments regarding this agenda item? Yes, we do have our first public comment. We'll come from caller ending in 1402. Uh, James Holmes, Larkspur. Uh, three points, if I may. Uh, first, the city certainly has some impressive applicants. Uh, in choosing among them, 
Uh, one important point to keep in mind is that the particular role of an appointee will be to champion the interests of the community as distinguished from the interests of the home key project, which of course already has an impressive array of, of champions. Second, I'd urge that a key aspect of any successful applicant's uh, preparation for the job would be to read or reread very carefully Mayor Hilmer's February 11th, 2022 letter to the county regarding the home key project. That very articulate letter contains important ideas and proposals for safeguarding the community's interests, and hopefully the appointees will work to implement the proposals uh, in that letter. Finally, as a matter of information, in, if anyone didn't know, a recent public legal notice in the newspaper revealed that the Project Home Key sponsor, Episcopal Community Services of San Francisco, has set up a separate LLC to own and operate this project. An LLC, of course, is a well-recognized legal structure for walling off a venturer's assets from the liabilities arising from a new venture. Uh, this project uh, project's proponents have made some pretty substantial asks uh, in terms of both funding and indulgence from the community. Setting up a separate LLC might seem to suggest a certain reluctance on the owner-operator's part to put its assets where its asks are. Thank you. Can I just respond to that, uh, per the mayor? Yes, please. So that, that did come up, uh, the question about the financial arrangement and contracts uh, it did come up at the meeting last week. And I think there's going to be a presentation about all of that to the Board of Supervisors at an upcoming meeting to describe uh, the, the financial arrangement. And it was unclear to me um, exactly where that lies, but that is a conversation that is going to go to the Board of Supervisors. So he, uh, Mr. Holmes may want to see uh, when that's coming on their agenda to make sure he participates. Uh, and I'll also take those suggestions um, uh, and, and let um, Supervisor Rice know that our, our selectees, uh, a card to advisory group, really should get some background information, including the letter that the mayor wrote, so that they are up and in, in uh, up to speed on the current process. Uh, thank you very much. Are there other public comments this evening, Allison, on this item? I'm looking for any additional raised hands or anyone from the audience. There's no further public comment. Uh, would either Council Member Way or Council Member Kandel like to move the appointment of Christy Chandler and Barry Fegan this evening to this uh, advisory group related to the 1251 South Alessio Project Home Key uh, project and process. Uh, I'd be happy to make that motion. May I have a second? Okay, I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Allison, would you please call the roll? Council Member Kandel? Yes. Council Member Hara? Yes. Council Member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Paulson? Yes. Mayor Homer. Yes. And let me express the council's gratitude to all the members of the public who applied to serve on this committee. Um, as in all of our uh, committees and commission work, we would encourage all of you to take part. And I'm sure you'll, you'll find that uh, you can still stay very active in, in the process and you'll be welcome. Uh, quite often members of the public are listened to more carefully than members sitting on the committee. So I think you might be uh, in a better spot now. So um, with that, uh, I, I th also wanna thank council members uh, Kandel and, and Way for their work here. Uh, do we have any further council comment or discussion on this item? Thank you very much. Right, we'll move to the next business item, which is an, an update on the city's application for the building forward infrastructure grant. And, and the uh, authorization resolution uh, that we'll formalize this evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be giving a staff report. And I think Allison's going to put a, a very simple PowerPoint that I wanted to put on the screen for folks 
in our audience who may not have had an opportunity to read the staff report as we go through, oh, something's gone wrong with the PowerPoint. We lost some of the, something there. Well, as Allison tries to, to correct whatever's going on with our laptop here, um, there we go, that looks better. I, we don't actually normally bring you presentations about grant applications until we're excited to tell you how much money we received, but there's two reasons we're doing this this evening. One is that part of this grant application asks that the city council acknowledge that by submitting the application, uh, you're making a commitment that the local match dollars will be available should you be awarded the grant. And so um, we weren't required to have that resolution when the application was due on March 21st, but we do need to get that as the final piece to our application. So the action I'll be asking for at the end of this item is to pass that resolution. I wanted to take this opportunity uh, to give you a quick summary of the way we're approaching this grant and how it differs from the way we've been talking about the project prior to the grant and the way we'll be talking about the project going forward should we not receive the grant in the full amount that we've requested. Um, and I want to take a moment to acknowledge that uh, this is one of those items where uh, I get to talk to you and it, it looks like I did a whole lot, but I didn't. It was Mr. Skinner, your public works director, Mr. Escobedo, the community service director are both here and far better equipped than me to answer any questions you might have about the details uh, in the material. So uh, as I said, by adopting the resolution this evening, you're going to be affirming that the city can provide a local match. Um, and a local match here would be for every dollar we get from the state, we're supposed to provide a dollar locally. Uh, those local sources can be us, or in this case, it can be the money raised by our partner, the Commons Foundation, um, and or the two in combination or some other mix. So, when we went into the grant application, we were driven a lot in terms of the strategy and approach by the parameters of the grant itself. And as I go into more detail in the staff report, as, and if you've had an opportunity to, to go through some of the supporting material, uh, in some respects, we have a project that should be very attractive to this grant uh, administrator group that, that's making the awards. And in other respects, we have a very unattractive grant proposal. On the unattractive side, there's a heavy emphasis in this grant program to direct funding into communities of need, uh, underserved communities, um, and we don't hit the buttons, the metrics very well that they're using to measure that. Um, that probably is not that surprising. But a second set of criteria, I'll uh, focus on the issue of health and safety and whether or not uh, your current facility provides a health and safety, health, healthy and safe environment for people to uh, use the library and enjoy the library. And in that respect, we score very high. Um, our library is open part of the week. You can come in, you'll, you know, we feel you'll be safe, but none of us feel this library is safe for the long haul. And we know it has significant accessibility issues, which is also something that we emphasized quite a bit in this application. The grant said, if you are pursuing a, a replacement facility, rather than trying to fix the facility that you have, you have to explain why you're doing that. And then you need to explain exactly what it is you're replacing. And then you can only apply to replacing kind. So what that means is that you can't ask them to pay the state to fund a bigger facility than the one you already have. Um, and that was a key issue for staff as we tried to focus on how we would strategize this grant application. So um, 
Mr. Skinner did an analysis of this building and everything in this building that the library uses solely for library purposes or shares with the administration, shares with the city council and concluded that in total, there's 6,800 and 6,845 square feet of space in this building that's being used in some capacity by the library. And we, so that's the amount we felt we could justify in the grant. We then asked our advisory team through Kitchell Corporation to uh, give us some thoughts on what it would cost to replace 6,845 square feet over at the Rose Lane facility. Um, there's so many unknowns. We don't have a design. So we're working from concept, uh, which is in and of itself an uncertainty when you're doing a construction project. We have a lot of contingencies to put into play, not the least of which is we're experiencing or seeing signs of the economy entering into a period of inflation. Um, we're seeing issues with material goods. Um, we don't know at any given time what the construction market's gonna look like for a public building. So we looked through the grants direction and we put together what we thought was a pretty um, good contingency plan. And following the directions, we applied for the maximum amount we felt we could justify. That amount is 10.4 million for the entire project. So that means we're saying that please give us 5.2 million and we will, with our partner, the Commons Foundation, come up with 5.2 million. I'm taking you through this long discussion in this particular part of the grant because this is very different than the way we've been talking about this project up until now. And in a minute, I'll remind everybody the way we've been thinking about this project and the way we may end up still thinking about it. Um, we've never said there's a fixed size that we've never said we need to move like in kind facility from one space to another. That's not the way we've talked about the new library, but it's the way we had to talk about the library to apply for this grant. And so I want folks to understand that that 10.4 number is very specific to the exercise that the state requested of us. If we get 5.2 million from the state, we will happily proceed with our partner to figure out how to get all that money and build that 10.4 million dollar facility. Um, we'll see. So uh, the let's transition briefly, though, to um, what happens if we don't get 5.2 million. The grant allows that the state may award a partial award. They may say, OK, we've looked at what we have available. We've judged the merits of your application. We've scored it against other applications and we're giving you X amount. And so that would just end up going into the pot with the money we're getting from the Commons Foundation uh, to uh, build what we can. And so that takes us back to the way we've always talked about this project, which is we're going to establish how much money we have, and then we're gonna find out how much, what type of facility that money can build. In both of these exercises, there's all sorts of unknowns. We've talked to you about some of them before, which is what, what type of materials would we use? Would we uh, use new construction? Uh, would we go with prefabricated construction offsite that's brought onto the property? And so all of those things would still need to be in play. And so we still have made a lot of these decisions and I don't want folks to think we have in any way done that. What I can say uh, before I turn it over to the council for questions, uh, there's two things I wanna emphasize. One is if we get an award, what has been a nice paced project where we're driving in the, on the street in Larkspur and we're going about 30 miles an hour, we're suddenly on the freeway and we're going 60, 70 miles an hour and we're gonna need money fast. We're gonna need our partner at the table. We're gonna need to make all of this work. So. Um, we've been in constant contact with the Commons Foundation. Councilmember Harf and I uh, attended a meeting with them about a week ago. They're up to date on where we are. They're, you know, they've shared with us where they are. They are working hard on their target of five million toward the end of this year. Um, and they started talking optimistically about putting the pedal to the metal with us and 
trying to get that money faster if we get this state award, because the state's gonna wanna see progress as quickly as possible once they tell us how much they're willing to chip in. Uh, and then I did want to note, because somebody who's read through this whole packet might be having some sticker shock if they saw the study about City Hall. Um, we had to apply that same set of logic to City Hall so that we're talking apples to apples. Up until now, we've been telling you rehabilitating this building is about $11 million. And with all those contingencies, with all those uncertainties, that number goes up to $18 million. The truth is somewhere in between, and none of us will know until we know what we're doing with this building and, and how we're rehabilitating it, if we're doing it, if someone else is doing it. Um, but that's a pretty scary spread regardless. Um, but I did want to call your attention to that because folks may be reading that and wondering what happened. It's because we wanted to submit to the state something that was consistent throughout in terms of the way we had thought about the capital projects. And so that's where you're seeing that, that newer number and that newer analysis. I'm available to answer questions. And uh, as I said, you have Mr. Skinner and Mr. Escobedo here, if you have any additional questions for them. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Are there members of the council that have questions for the city manager, Vice Mayor Paulson? Yeah, thank you. Um, just a couple of qu basic questions um, regarding the 50% uh, match, um, there's no stipulation that we can't exceed that, right? So if we say it's 10 million and then we end up doing 12, the, the state doesn't put any conditions that, hey, you were after 10, you know, why are you putting in seven now and we put in five? I'm gonna have to turn to Mr. Skinner, but I don't think the grant material even spoke to what you're talking about. Um, I guess this will be my editorial comment uh, Julian and I have collaborated on other grants and this one's just different. It's, it's written differently. It's the way it went after the question of what you're trying to do is different. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the answer to your question is we'll find out when we engage the state. <laughs> um, but of course you can phase things. So mm -hmm. if, if the state says build what you said you were gonna build the 6,845, and then more money materializes and you want to build a phase two that connects to phase one. I, I don't, I don't think you'd be tripping any rules then to do that. Okay. If I, if I might, um, any estimates going to be obsolete in 60 days anyway. So I think that concern is moot. Okay. Um, and then the other is, um, did the grant uh, application include, you know, the, the 6,845 square feet, um, we call it library, but if we're doing apples to apples, were we assuming that the new building would also have government offices you know, when we made the grant or would, did we say it's pure library? No, so the government offices are not included in that 6,845 square foot number. It's the library, what you think, you and the public think of as library first comes in your head downstairs on the first floor. Uh, it's the common areas like the lobbies. It's the restrooms, it's this room, because this is the program room for the library, mm. um, but not the administrative offices. They're not part of that okay. map. Uh, I think the kitchen was included. Yeah, the kitchen was included. Okay, so then it makes some sense that the rehab of this building would be more than what, so it's not really pound for pound. If we say that we're comparing City Hall to be, you know, uh, completely brought up because that would include additional space beyond the 6,800 and beyond just library. It would include public off, public uh, city hall offices. Well, it's not just that. You're correct, but it's not just that. You also are talking about rehabilitating a 100-year-old building versus new construction. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. that's even, even doing our best to make apples to apples, you can't truly do that because those are very different exercises, new construction and, and trying to make this building modern as possible. Okay, understood, thank you. Other council member uh, questions? Kevin? Uh, not a question, I just wanna uh, express appreciation for the thoughtfulness that um, the team has put together in pursuing this grant. grant. Um, and also to express appreciation for uh, you know, the Commons Foundation who have uh, been fastidious in their support of this project and their encouragement of what uh, we've done with the grant application and um, uh, optimism that they will be there 
through the end in this process. And I just think it's a, a terrific commitment to our community that they've made. Um, a combination, this is, this is a truly public-private partnership, and I think it will be a great success. I'm grateful that uh, you've been able to bring all the efforts together into this grant application. I think it's a wonderful opportunity and, uh, and I'll be trying to keep uh, as many options open for as long as possible so that whatever we have at the time we need to, we can make the right decision. Are there other uh, council member comments or questions on this item? If not, uh, Catherine Way, and then we'll go to public comment. Hi, thank, thanks. Um, I want to echo what Kevin uh, has just said. We've been sitting on this committee now with the Commons, working with the Commons Foundation uh, members and the Friends of the Library for several years, and actually been involved in this process now since we were both elected in 2013. So it's a long, it's been a long haul and a lot of patience, but I, I think we're reaching a pinnacle now of I see success happening. And the staff really needs our um, support and uh, compliment or compliments for really engaging in a thoughtful application. I know many members of the commons and, and others were interested in, in facilitating that, but the, the, the expertise in this document I think shows um, I know Franklin, our librarian, our li library director, and Julian Skinner spend a lot of time putting this together. So I really appreciate that. I've heard great things from the community when I visit the library about where this is coming. Um, I think I need to uh, reinforce what Manager Schwartz just said that we're going to enter the freeway if we get um, approved, because if you look at the all grants must be expended by March 31st, 2026. And that seems like a long way away, but it actually isn't. So we know how Larkspur sometimes um, takes a long time to make decisions. Well, if we get this money, which I'm, my fingers are crossed, we're going to have to move fast. So I'm um, looking forward to that. And we do have a good team now. Uh, and then lastly, um, this uh, the fundraising that the Commons uh, group has been doing has been terrific, but there's still a lot needed. So continue to reach out in your community um, uh, with uh, family uh, with people in your community who might be interested in participating, and give them the information about how they can. So um, I know in the audience we have a lot of the Commons. Um, people, uh, foundation uh, members there. And I just, you know, my heart goes out to the amount of work you're putting into this as volunteers. Uh, thank you. Uh, Council Member Kandel. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I just wanted to give my, my sincere thank you to the Commons Foundation. I honestly don't know if we would be here if it were not for them uh, and their continued uh, insistence and fundraising efforts and uh, drive. And I, uh, I'm just so grateful. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Let's open it to public comment. Are there members of the public that would like to make comments or ask questions on this agenda item? Allison? I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. Anyone in the chambers? And I'm just looking for any raised hands. And there's no public comment. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sure people are appreciative of the staff work and the work of the Commons Foundation, as well as the city's contribution of the land that will uh, make up the project should we find the resources. Uh, Dan Schwartz, would you like to make any further comments on this item? No, Mr. Mayor, I just uh, I'd ask that you pass the resolution. All right. I would entertain a motion for consideration of resolution 23 slash 22. I'll move that, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll move resolution 23 22, a resolution of the City Council and the City of Larkspur authorizing the grant application, acceptance, and execution of the grant funds for the State of California Budget Act 2021. And I've I'll got second. both fingers crossed and both my toes crossed. Huh. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. May we please have a roll call? Council Member Kandel? Yes. Council Member Hara? Yes. Council Member Way? Yes. 
Vice Mayor Paulson? Yes. Mayor Hilmer? Yes, that passes unanimously. That concludes our business items this evening. If I could just add one final Council Member Haro. Um, I personally like driving on freeways, so I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Before you adjourn, I, I was hoping I could make a comment. Uh, Please do. Um, I really want to acknowledge and thank City Clerk Allison Fallis and the staff of the Community uh, Media Center of Marin uh, for Little Larkspur and its 100-year-old building to figure out how to pull off a hybrid meeting. Uh, a few folks, maybe a council member too, saw us panicking about an hour before the meeting trying to make it all come together because we thought we had it all set, but um, Allison kept her cool. The media center folks kept her cool and, and got us up and running. And uh, I think this went pretty well for a first try. I think, I think it went remarkably well and uh, very smoothly. Yeah, I like very, this. Very professionally done, thank you. Yeah, and second, uh, the city manager, I, I told Allison recently, she's not doing MWPA uh, running the meetings and it's not the same without her, so yeah. You have a great resource. Thank you. I think we all agree. Allison is the best. <laughs> all right. If we have no further items this evening, we'll move on to item nine, which is adjournment. And we have a motion to adjourn. So moved. I hear a second. Second. All right. Without objection, we are adjourned uh, to the, our regular meeting of April 20th, 2022. Thank you very much for participating this evening. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Good, Good job. Stay safe. Thank you.